Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson Chapter 12 Council of War There was a great rush of feet across the deck. I could hear people tumbling up the cabins at the fossil, and slipping in an instant outside my barrel. I dived behind the foresail, made a double towards the stern, and came out upon the open deck in time to join Hunter and Dr. Livesey in the rush for the weather boat. All hands were already congregated. A belt of fog had lifted almost simultaneously with an appearance of the moon, away to the southwest with us. We saw two low hills, about a couple of miles apart, rising behind one of them in a third <clears throat> higher hill whose peak still buried in the fog. All three seemed sharp and conical in figure. So much as I saw, almost in a dream, for I had not yet recovered from my horrid fear from a minute or two before. And then I heard the voice of Captain Smollett issuing orders. The Hispaniola was laid a couple of points nearer the wind, and I was sailed a course that would be just clear the island on the east. And now, men, said the captain, when all was sheeted home, has any one of you seen that land ahead? I have, sir, said Silver. I watered there with a trader I was cook in. The anchorage is on the south, behind an island, I fancy, said the captain. Yes, sir. Skeleton Island, they call it. It was a main place for pirates once, in a hand we had on board known for their names for it. That hill to the Norhart they call the Foremast Hill. There are three hills in the row, row running southwards for Maine in Mizzen, sir, but the Maine has the big un with a cloud on it. They usually call that the spyglass, by the reasons of a lookout they keep when they was in anchorage or cleaning. For it's there they clean their ships, sir, asking your pardon. I have a chart here, said Captain Smollett. See if that's the place. Long John's eyes burned on his head as he took the chart, but by the fresh look of the paper I knew he was doomed to disappointment. This was not the map we found in Billy Bone's chest, but an accurate copy complete in all things, the names, in heights, and soundings, with a single exception of the red crosses in the written notes. Sheriff had been in his annoyance. Silver had the strength of mind to hide it. Yes, sir, said he, this is the spot to be sure, and very prettily drawn out. Who might have done that, I wonder? The pirates are too ignorant, I reckon. Aye, here it is, Captain Kid Anchorage. Just the name my shipmate called it. There was a strong current runs along the south, then north, nor, nord of the south coast, west coast. Right what you was, sir, said he, to haul your wind and keep the weather of the island. Leastways, if such was your intentions as to enter in Korean, and there ain't no better place for that in these waters. Thank you, my man, says Captain Smollett. If ask you later on to give us an help, you may go. <clears throat> Thank you. I was surprised at, at the coolness of which Long John <clears throat> avowed his knowledge of the island, and I owed it. I was half frightened when I saw him drawing nearer to myself. He did not know to be sure that I had overheard his counsel from the apple barrel. Yet I had, by this time, taken such a horror of his cruelty, duplicity, and power that I could scarce conceal a shudder when he laid his hand upon my arm. Ah, he said, here's the sweet spot, this island, a sweet spot for a lad to get ashore on. You'll bathe, and you'll climb trees. You'll hunt goats, you will, and you'll get aloft on them hills like a goat yourself. Why, it makes me young again. I was going to forget my timber leg. I was. <clears throat> it was a pleasant thing to be young and have ten toes, and you may lay to that. When you want to go on a bit of exploring, you'll just ask old Aunt John and he'll put up a snack for you to take along. And clapping me in the friendliest way upon the shoulder, he hobbled off forward <clears throat> and went below. Captain Chamalet, the squire, and Dr. Livesey were talking together on the quarter deck, and anxious as I was to tell them my story, I durst not interrupt them openly, while I was still casting about my in my thoughts to find some probable excuse. Dr. Livesey called me to his side. He had left his pipe below in being a slave to tobacco, and had meant I should fetch it. 
But as soon as I was near enough to speak and not be overheard, I broke it immediately. Doctor, let me speak. Get the captain and the squire down to the cabin and make them pretend to send for me. I have terrible news. The doctor changed countenance a little, but the next moment he was the master of himself. Thank you, Jim, he said quite loudly. That was all I wanted to know, as if he had asked me a question. And with that, he turned his heel and rejoined the other two. They spoke together for a little, though none of them started, or raised his voice, as so much as whistled. It was plain enough that Dr. Lysy had communicated my request, for the next thing I heard was the captain giving an order to Job Anderson, and all hands were piped down on decks. My lads, <clears throat> said Captain Charlotte, I have a word to say to you. This land that we have sent in this place have been sailing to Mr. Charlie Alwee. Very, being very open-handed gentlemen, we have all know he had just asked me a word or two, as I was able to tell him that every man on board had done his duty, although in a loft. I have never asked to see done better. Why, he and I and the doctor are going below to the cabin to drink your health and luck, and you'll have the grog serve out for you to drink our health and luck. And I'll tell you that I think of this. I think it's handsome. And if you think as I do, <clears throat> you'll give a good sea cheer for the gentleman that does it. The cheer followed, and there was a matter of course, but it rang out so full and hearty that I confess I could hardly believe these name men were plotting out for our blood. One more cheer for Captain Schmollett, cried Long John, when the first had subsided. This was also given at will. On the top of that, the three gentlemen went below, had not long after word sent forward that Jim Hawkins wanted in the cabin. I found them all three seated round the table, a bottle of Spanish wine and some raisins for them. The doctor was smoking away, and his wig in his lap. That I knew that was a sign that he was agitated. The stern window was open for a warm night, that you could see the moon shining <clears throat> behind on the ship's wake. Now, Hawkins, said the squire, speak up. You have something to say, speak up. I did as I was bid, and as short as I can make it, told the whole detail of Silver's conversation. Nobody interrupted me till I was done. Nor did any one of the three make so much as a movement, but they kept their eyes on my face from first to last. Jim, said Dr. Livesey, take a seat. And they made me sit down on the table. Besides there, poured me out a glass of wine, filled my hands with raisins, and all other three, one after another, each with a bow, drank my good health in their service to me for my luck and courage. Now, Captain, said the squire, you were right, and I was wrong. I hold myself an ass. I await your orders. No more than an ass than I, sir, returned the captain. I never heard of a crew than to mutiny what showed sign before, for any man that had an eye in his head to see the mischief and t take steps according. But this crew, he added, beats me. Captain, said the doctor, with your permission, that's Silver, a very remarkable man. He looks he looks remarkably well from a yard arm, sir returned the captain, but this is talk. This doesn't, don't lead to anything. I see three or four points, with, and this Mr. Trollowy's permission, I'll name them. You, sir, are the captain. It is for you to speak, says Mr. Trollowy, grandly. First point, began Mr. Smollett. We must go on, because we can't turn back. If I gave word to go about, they would rise at once. Second point, they have time before us, at least, until this treasure is found. Third point, they are faithful hands. Now, sir, it is coming to blow sooner or later. What I propose is to take the by the take time by the forelock, and as to say is in to come blows by fine days when they least expect it. We can count. I take it on your own home servants, Mr. Trelawi. As upon myself, de declared the squire. Three, reckoned the captain. Ourselves make seven. Counting Hawkins here, what about honest hands? Most likely Trelawi's own men, said the doctor. Those who had picked up for himself before he lit on silver. Nay, said the squire. Hands, hands on what of mine. I did think I had trusted hands at the captain. And to think that they are all Englishmen, broke out the squire. Sir. I could find it in my heart to blow the ship up. 
Well, gentlemen, said this captain, the best I could say is not much. We must lay to, if you please, and keep a bright lookout. It's trying on a man, I know, but it would look pleasanter to come to blows. There is no help for it till we know our men. Lay to and whistle for a wind. That's my view. Jim here, said the doctor, can help us more than anyone. These men are not shy with him. Jim is a noticing lad. Hawkins, I put prodigious faith in you, in other squire. I, I began to put pretty desperate at this, for I felt altogether, indeed, through me, that safety came. In the meantime, talk as we pleased that there were only seven out of twenty-six on Wom whom we could rely. Out of these seven was one boy, so that grown men out of our size inside were six to their nineteen.